Right. Students, uh, this is the official starting of the session of 2000-2021. In this situation, there's nothing to do but uh, we have to carry on our teaching learning process like this. So I would start with a chapter of demand analysis. Demand analysis is the first chapter in class 12 syllabus. And after that, we would go into elasticity of demand, quite related to this chapter. Firstly, I would start in this chapter. It's a very conceptual chapter. What do you mean when we say demand? <clears throat> now, there is a subtle difference between desire and demand. Desire means a mere wish to have something. A mere wish to have something. And it may be that the required purchasing power is not there with the person. Still, the person wants it, means has a wish to have it. The required purchasing power may not be there. Then it is desire. Whereas when we consider demand, demand is an effective desire. Effective desire means when the desire is backed by, supported by the required purchasing power. The person has a wish to have something and in order to have that, the required purchasing power, monetary ability to buy it, he or she has it then this is called de demand. So this is the difference between desire and demand. Next we come to what do you mean by demand for a commodity? What do you mean by demand for a commodity? Demand for a commodity refers to the quantity of the commodity that is purchased, that is demanded by an individual or by many individuals at a particular price during a particular period of time. Very simple. Quantity of the commodity that is purchased at a particular price during a particular period of time by an individual or by many individuals taken together. This is demand for a commodity. Now we come to the next topic which is regarding different types of demand. Types of demand. One after the other, I would go into the details of each of these types. The first one, individual demand and then market demand. Individual demand for a commodity refers to the quantity of the commodity that is demanded, that is purchased at a particular price during a particular period of time by one individual consumer only. Here we are dealing with only one individual consumer. So individual demand for a commodity refers to the quantity of the commodity that is purchased, that is demanded at a particular price during a particular period of time by one individual consumer, by one individual consumer, by one individual uh, customer only. This is individual demand. Now I come to market demand. Market demand for a commodity. Market demand for a commodity refers to the total quantity of the commodity that is purchased at a particular price or we can say at specific different prices during a particular period of time by all the consumers in the entire market. So market demand for a commodity refers to the total quantity of the commodity that is purchased or demanded at specific or different prices by all the consumers in the market, all, then this is market demand. So there lies a difference between individual demand and market demand. Fine. Now, the next few. The next one is joint demand, J-O-I-N-T, joint demand. Joint demand 
is actually of two commodities. Two commodities, when the two commodities are demanded together, they have to be demanded together. One commodity cannot be used without the other, made for each other. So here the demand for one commodity will be there when the demand for the other commodity is there. Like uh, demand for car and demand for tires. Car and tires. Pen and ink. Blackboard and chalk. Though this is a whiteboard and here we use a whiteboard marker. So we can say whiteboard and whiteboard marker. Blackboard and, black and chalk. Pen and ink. I said car and tires, you can say car and fuel, like petrol and diesel. Please don't give an example, which is sometimes given by some people, uh, bread and butter. We should not give this example, I personally think, because is it that bread and butter are complementary? That means uh, bread has to be used with butter, not at all, no, because Bread can be used with cheese, bread can be used with but, uh, um, jelly, with jam, with eggs, many other things. So it's not obvious that bread has to be used with butter. So I personally think don't, you should not use this example. So this is joint demand. Joint demand refers to the demand for two commodities. When the two commodities have to be used or demanded together. Next, composite demand. C-O-M-P-O-S-I-T-E. Composite demand. Now see, composite demand for a commodity refers to the demand for a commodity which can be used for several purposes. When a commodity can be used, can be demanded for several purposes, for several uses, then the demand for that commodity is said to be composite demand. Like demand for electricity, demand for steel, demand for milk, demand for sugar, see the example which I have given, all these goods can be used for so many purposes, that is why composite demand. Next, uh, ex ante demand and ex post demand, ex ante, ex, another word, ante, a-n-t-e, it's not ante, it's ante, ex ante demand. Exante demand refers to the demand for a commodity which is an expected demand, a notion, an idea, an expectation, uh, which is uh, how much amount of the commodity, how much quantity of the commodity is expected to be bought, is expected to be purchased. This is uh, ex ante demand. And that is the reason why, as it's an idea, a notion. So, we uh, use the term notional demand also. Ex ante demand and ex post demand. Now we come to ex post demand. This was ex ante demand. Ex post, P-O-S-T. See, post means coming after. So, ex post demand is the actual demand. Ex post demand is the actual demand for a commodity. So ex ante demand is the expected demand before the actual consumption. And ex post demand is the actual quantity of the commodity which is purchased, which is revealed now. But after the actual consumption, how much of the commodity is purchased actually? That is ex post demand. So this is the difference between ex ante demand and ex post demand. And these are all, these are all the types of demand, all the types of demand I have explained. One, number one is individual demand, then market demand. Number three, joint demand. Number four is composite demand. And five and six, ex ante demand, exposed demand. Fine. Now I would move into all these uh, coming IEC examination uh, as short questions. Now I would move into a long answers topic which often come as a six marks question. Sometimes they may give three marks but now remember when you are given a question of six marks you are supposed to write four points and in the points heading carries half mark, explanation carries one mark. Then for each point one and a half 
how many points you are writing? 4, 4 into 1 and a half, 6. 4 into 1 and a half, 6. So, you are supposed to write 4 points. Okay. Now, not only 4, I would discuss all the points here, which are the factors determining demand. This is the topic. The topic is factors determining demand, factors affecting demand, factors influencing demand. Or the question can be, explain the main determinants of demand, D-E-T-E-R-M-I-N-A-N-T-S, determinants of demand. Determinants means the factors we determine. Okay. Now, let's start. In the answer, the first point, the first point is own price of the commodity. The commodity with which we are concerned, own price of that very commodity. We are concerned with that commodity. The own, own its own price. Now, how does its own price affect the demand is very easy. You all know that. When the price of our commodity rises, its quantity demanded falls. When the price of our commodity rises, its quantity demanded falls. And when the price of a commodity falls, its quantity demanded rises. Like when we see, uh, suppose a uh, commodity we often buy, we often buy a commodity and the price of that commodity is rising continuously. Day after day we are seeing that we are, uh, the price of the commodity is rising. Then what will be our natural tendency? Our natural tendency here would be to buy less and less amount of that commodity. This is very natural instinct of our human beings. And when we see the price of our commodity falling day by day, then we have a tendency to buy it more. We are encouraged to buy more. Uh, we have a tendency to buy more. Thus, the bottom line here is price rises, demand falls. Price falls, demand rises. First one. Number two. Second determinant of demand is income of the consumer. Income of the consumer. Now, uh, while discussing this factor, income of the consumer, how does income of the consumer affect the demand for a commodity? Uh, in order to discuss this, in order to explain this, we have to categorize the goods into three categories. We have to categorize the goods into three categories. First, category A. Mostly, the goods that we consume, normally, generally, usually. These goods are such that, these goods are such that, when the income of the consumer increases, the demand for the commodity also increases. Income increases, demand increases. Normally this happens. And that is why these goods are called normal goods. Mind it? Normal goods. Example, any example you can give. Furniture, electronic goods, garments, stationary goods, cosmetic goods, most of the food items, all of these are examples. This is first category. Second category now. Second category, there are certain goods, though few in number, though few in number, but there are certain goods, in which case, when income of the consumer increases, the demand falls. When income of the consumer increases, the demand falls. Really, this happens. And these goods are called inferior goods. Uh, these goods are called inferior goods. Example. In Frank's textbook, the example that is given is maize. M-A-I-Z-E. Maize. In some other books, some other examples are also given. Like jaggery or molasses or gur. Another example is vanaspati. That is uh, what we colloquially known as dalga. That is actually vanaspati. So these are examples. It can be maize, jawar, bajra, ragi. These can be examples. In Frank's textbook, they have given example uh, maize. This happens. Suppose not only not in Bengal actually. In Bengal, maize is not a very common food item. But in Madhya Pradesh, in Gujarat, in some other states, I've got this information. I've uh, come to know about this. That in those states, when a family is poor, when a family is poor, then uh, they consume a lot of uh, maize and jawar, bajra, ragi, these. Because they cannot afford to buy more of rice and wheat. But when this family gradually grows richer and richer, their income is rising, their income earning is rising. 
Then, they reduce the consumption of maize slowly. And they increase the consumption of rice and wheat. This happens. So, we find maize, the consumption, the demand for maize decreases when the income of the consumer increases. So, these goods are called inferior goods. Next. Third category, these goods we call, the third category goods we call, inexpensive necessities. Inexpensive necessities. What do you mean by inexpensive? Very cheap, very less costly, very cheap, very less costly. Necessities, very essential goods in our life. Very essential goods in our life. Like uh, matchboxes, salt, safety pins, candles, needles, etc. See, these goods, the example which I have given, these goods are very cheap, very cheap, but these goods are very, very essential in our life. Now, what happens is, initially, uh, when the family is poor, then the family man is buying very, very less amount of these goods. Now, when the income of the consumer is increasing a little, initially, when the income increases, then the demand for that commodity, that very commodity, the demand, increases to a little extent increases to a little extent but up to a certain level then after that level is crossed even if the income increases furthermore the demand remains constant okay be sure initially when the income increases <clears throat> the demand increases to a little extent but after a certain level even if the income increases furthermore the demand remains unchanged the demand remains constant this happens. So this is all about the second factor determining demand which is income of the consumer. Now I come to the third point. Third point. Taste and preference of the consumer. T-A-S-T-E. Taste and preference of the consumers. It's very obvious when people's taste and preference, when people's taste and preference move, in, moves in favor of a particular commodity, moves in favor of a particular commodity, then the demand for that commodity will automatically rise. And <clears throat> if people's taste and preference decline from a commodity, move away from a particular commodity, then its demand will fall. Then its demand will fall. Like for example, I'm giving an example, a very uh, practical example. About 60-70 uh, years ago, in Bengal, in Bihar, in UP, in Orissa, in most of the states in India, the male people, mostly, almost all, the male people, not only of my age, of your age also, young people. The male people used to wear Indian traditional garments like dhoti kurta. And that is why the demand for dhoti kurta was tremendously high. And that was the fashion at that time. That was the fashion, the trend. Uh, why I am saying that that was the fashion or trend I've seen, I've watched movies, olden days movies, Bengali films of Uttam Kumar or, uh, or uh, Dilip Kumar, Raj Kapoor. In the films, the hero used to wear dhoti kurta. That means that was the trend, that was the fashion. And so we find people's taste and preference was in favor of this kind of commodity. And that is why the demand was quite high. Years have passed. We the Indians, we have been influenced more and more by Western culture. Earlier it was British culture, now it's American culture. So, uh, the people's taste and preference has moved in favor of Western garments. And people's taste and preference has moved away from Indian traditional garments. That is why we find now the demand for jeans, the demand for multi-pocket cargo trousers, this has increased a lot. And the demand for dhoti kutta has gone down so much. That shows. Now, this is the third point. Now we come to the fourth point. The fourth factor determining demand. Prices of related goods. Prices of related goods. Actually, related goods are of two types. Number one, substitute goods. Substitute goods. Now, what are substitute goods? Two goods are said to be substitute goods. Two goods are said to be substitute goods. When one good... In between the two, one good can be used in place of the other. Tea and coffee. Spectacles and contact lens. These are examples. Okay. <clears throat> Here, if the change in the price of one commodity in between the two 
if there is a change in the price of one commodity, there will be a change in the demand for the other commodity. Like if the price of T rises, T E A T. If the price of T rises, the demand for T will fall, and so the demand for coffee will rise. Why not? Some people, when they are finding that uh, the T price of T is rising, they either they will stop the consumption of T or they will switch over to the substitute. What is the substitute? The substitute is coffee. So they would switch over to coffee's consumption. And that is why even when the price of coffee has remained the same, the demand for coffee will be rising. This is the thing. So this is the first. I said related goods are of two types. This is the first type. Second type. The second type is complementary goods or we can say complements. Uh, complementary goods or complements. See, two goods are said to be complementary goods or complements when both the goods have to be demanded jointly. A few minutes ago I said joint demand. That's the same thing. When two goods have to be used together, made for each other, one has to be used along with the other one. One cannot be used without the other one. Then the demand is called joint demand and the two goods are called complementary goods. Car and tires, car and fuel, pen and ink. These are. Now, here also, if the change in the price of one good, there will be a change in the demand for the other good. Like if price of car falls, suppose if price of car falls, then the demand for cars will rise. And so definitely the demand for tires will rise because no cars can be sold without tires. When the price of car falls, the demand for cars will rise. That means more cars will be sold in the market. More cars will be demanded in the market. Now, if more cars are demanded in the market, more cars will be sold in the market. Those additional number of cars will be sold with tires only. So demand for tires will rise. So this is the fourth factor prices of related goods. Now we come to the fifth factor, number five. Number five is consumer's future price expectation. Consumer's future price expectation. You will be able to understand this very clearly, I think, if I give an example to illustrate this. Suppose, suppose I go to the market every day. Suppose I go to the market every day. Now, for the last two to three weeks or one or two weeks, I have observed when I was, I was going to the market that price of onion has been rising. Price of onion has been rising continuously day after day. Even today when I went to the market, I found that uh, price of onion has increased furthermore. Though nowadays we are not going to the market. Uh, anyway, suppose I today also I found that price of onion has increased furthermore then. If I observed in the last few weeks the price of onion has increased, even today it has increased furthermore, I as a consumer may expect that the price of onion would rise furthermore in the near future. Like in the next one or two weeks, next seven days or ten days later, the price of onion would rise furthermore. If I as a consumer have this kind of expectation, then what would be I doing? What would I do? What would be my reaction? Shall I buy more at present or shall I buy less? Obviously more. If I'm expecting that in the near future the price will rise furthermore, then I should buy more. I will be buying more at present. Because if I wait, if I don't buy more, larger amount, then after two days, after seven days, after ten days, if I wait and then buy, I will have to spend more. Who wants to spend more, man? No one wants to spend more. Everybody wants to save more and spend less. And that is why here we find if the consumer's expectation regarding the future price of a commodity is such that the price is going to rise in the near future, then at present the demand at present the demand would be more. Opposite is also true. If in the present time the expectation regarding the future price of a commodity is such that in the near future the price would rise, would, would fall furthermore, sorry, for it would fall. There would be a fall in the price in the near future. Then at present, I would buy less. A consumer, a sensible consumer, would buy less at present. Because I am expecting that in the near future the price would fall. I should wait then. I should wait. 
when the price will fall further more, then I can buy more. So at present, the demand will be less. So this is how future price expectation of the consumer regarding the future price of the commodity uh, affect the demand. Next. Consumer's credit facility. The next point is consumer's credit facility. Now, what do you mean by credit facility? Credit facility means availability of loans. Availability of loans. Now, it's very obvious. If in the market, if in the economy or the society, more loans are available, more and more easy availability of credit facilities is there, then demand for many commodities, demand for many commodities will be rising, will be increasing. People would demand something more, which they did not expect, did not dream of buying or demanding earlier. Like, for example, it's not only an example, it's bare truth, it's a fact. That in the last 15 years or so, in India, the demand for cars has increased a lot. You know why? Because in the last 15 years, in India, 15 or uh, 20 years, in the last 15 to 20 years, the demand for cars has increased something tremendously because in the last 15 years, uh, the uh, availability of loans is quite easy for us. Loans are given, car loans are given. As loans are given so easily, so we are buying more and more cars. A person who did not imagine of buying a car in his lifetime, he is now buying a car. So this is consumer's credit facility, how it affects demand for a company. The next one, uh, size and composition of population. Size and composition of population. First size, then composition. Size is very easy. Size of the population means total number of people in the country. Total number of people in the country. If total number of people in the country increases, demand for many, many commodities will increase. If demand for, uh, if, the, if the total population decreases, total number of people decreases, then demand for many commodities will decrease. This is science. Now composition. Actually, there can be age composition, there can be sex composition. First, age composition. Age composition. If in the total population of the country, if the maximum percentage of the population consists of old aged people, suppose the composition is such that the maximum percentage of the total population consists of old aged people, then the <coughs> uh, demand for those commodities will be more, which are more commonly used by, which are more commonly used by old aged people, like walking sticks, like false tooth. Uh, these are example. These are examples I've given because these are more commonly used by old aged people. Okay, this is age composition. Now, sex composition. That means male female ratio. Uh, okay, let us co consider a state of India. In in, in that state, uh, the percentage of females is greater than the percentage of males. If the percentage of females is greater than the percentage of males, obviously in that state then. Demand for saris, that means the demand for female garments is more than the demand for uh, male garments. So this is how uh, the size and composition of the population affects demand for a commodity. Okay. Uh, so these are all the factors, these are all the factors which affect, which determine, which influence the demand for a commodity. Or we can say, uh, these are the factors on which demand depends. So today, Till here, I have discussed, I have explained. I think that's enough for one class, the introduction class for you. Uh, in the next session, in the next class, I'll proceed furthermore in this very chapter, that is the demand analysis chapter. Thank you.